think you need to see this. <laughs> Colby! It's the end of the line, Al. Old World Soulstorm, I've just seen it. Uh, it's it's faithful to the PlayStation games that I remember, the PlayStation 1 games that I remember. Uh, what is your goal in bringing back this sort of spiritual successor to those games? Well, uh, when we, we, we started off on the right track with Oddworld, you know, and then uh, uh, success sort of has its own problems. Yeah. Abe's Odyssey was very successful, but that forced us into situations where we had to really start producing the games faster and, you know, business partners, things happen. And somewhere along the line, immediately we sort of started getting off track from that big five-part epic story that we really wanted to deliver. And part two got distracted, and later it became called Abe's Exodus. But it was inspired by the original idea of what was going to be that game. And so after the success we had recently of remaking Abe's Odyssey, which we called New and Tasty, and that went, went over fabulously, and we were grateful for that. It enabled us the funding to actually build a brand new game. And the audience told us, do redo Exodus. And we're like, ah, if we're going to redo Exodus, we're going to do it the way we originally envisioned, which means it's a brand new game, and it's going to take the story to different heights. And so uh, that's what set forth in Soulstorm, and we pushed the bar in a number of levels for us. But we, what we wanted to do was... We wanted to evolve the idea of the platformer that so many of our fans were just really, really loved the way that platformers played. And we were like, okay, well, how do we really turn the dial up to 11 on that? How do we add a lot more dimension? How do we add a lot more things to do? How do we exploit and explore uh, this adventure in a deeper way and give the player a lot more agency to handle problems and puzzles with a lot wider array of choices and, and ways to do that? And so uh, that, that's put us about three years into development of really sort of heavy R&D and lots of experimentation and things you saw like, you know, liquid fire dynamics, like, like yeah. mechanics that took us a long time to get right, uh, really bo boosting up the physics in the 2.9D play where we're getting much more dimensionally into the world, even though it still plays like a platformer and it's still very relatively simple and twitchy and fast on the controls. There's just a lot more there that you can do, as you saw. And so the idea there was, well, if we really get to do a new game, you know, people have a high expectation bar from our new games. We usually have third-party publishing support for those, uh, or a you know, publisher paying for them. At this time, we're paying for it for ourselves, and we're like, wow, so we're going to come out with a new game. It's got to be at least as good as our old games. At absolute worst, it needs to be as good. But really, it's got to be better if we're going to stay in the game, and we've got to surprise people. We've got to hit, them, hit it a little harder than they thought we would have taken it. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we did, and hopefully people are responding that way. And so far, the reception is great. So, so you talked a bit about the technological advancements you're doing. The liquid fire dynamics was yeah. really good. Uh, how important was it to get those right and have that sort of technological spectacle in this game? Well, so that was some of the technology that we just started off with right in the beginning. I mean, aside from, okay, how do we fix the legacy issues of latency controls and responsiveness, and basically how do we make a more dynamic, faster, faster moving, you know, more responsive all the time. Inside of that, we were like, look, brew is at the heart of this game. The brew is something flammable. There's a deep mystery around it, and it's, got, it's, it's part of the greater mystery of this overall story arc. And with it, it's flammable. And it was always supposed to be flammable. Uh, and, but flammability is something in games, like we burn a lot of things, but not like real fire, yeah. right? And so we wanted to focus on that liquid flammability for trap making and things like very volatile substances that can blow up in your face, you know, kind of like dynamite or nitroglycerin. So in that, that was one of the first earliest things that we started R&Ding on was can we do the impression of like spreading gasoline or spreading a flammable substance all over the place and then just igniting it and it doing the proper thing that you would expect and then burning that into like an industrial inferno. And then when we got that working right, we were like, well, God, we really need to burn things down now, you know, so... How well can we, how far can we take this, this light, living force of fire? And that led to destructible, burnable uh, operations like entire mines that could be big mine shafts of, of wood could be ignited and burned and turned into huge industrial weapons. It's basically industrial failure and industrial disasters as weapons that you might create to use in the circumstances of, you know, Abe Free and his buddies. And so... 
that the fire led to the physics and the physics led to then various variations of that as you see where we wanted a playing field that would change shape over time that's the threat uh, and as the pressure against you, the forces are coming against you are sort of narrowing your options or opening up ways of new navigation. And so a more dynamic play environment that had a lot more uh, destructibility to it, which would, would change the playing field. And using that to your advantage, you know, or at times if you're on the run, your disadvantage. And also taking the Mudakins that you're rescuing, the slaves that you're rescuing out of these factory farms and factory industrial, you know, hell holes, is that uh, historically, those are beasts of burden. You know, you get him, he's got limited dynamics, you, you rescue him and you get some points. But they're really beasts of burden that you're just trying to keep alive. Well, this time we wanted to go, this is more like we're inciting uprising, right? We're inciting sort of rebellion. So why is it we're getting more guys and there's a lot more guys with us and they're not playing their part? Like, they're not helping in this offensive operation or defensive operation. They're not protecting us. So we wanted to add a whole other le level of agency and control to them, where any, any types of uh, armaments or things that I craft for myself, you know, weapons, uh, special things for special purposes, I can then distribute to my followers. So there's power in numbers, and then they become active defenders. And I can rely on that, right? So I'm basically, in each level, I'm sort of trying to rescue more and more and build a larger mob, and that mob has powers of scale. So they help loop for me, they help put us all out if we catch on fire in a very volatile situations, uh, and they'll fight for me when, when my back is turned. You know, So together, we form a more collective, brutal force. And at the heart of the technology, we really wanted to get lots of characters running on screen so we could really get into some more intense confrontations with, with a lot more pressure and, and needing characters to be at our defense because you know at times it would be overwhelming even for Abe and so it took a while to get all that chemistry running into something that really gelled made sense you know it's new it's it's different and ultimately it's not a revolutionary game these are it's an evolutionary game upon the you know platformer genre turning it more into a 2.9 more 2.9 D more fully uh, immersible and emergent sort of simulation of the world where you're provoking trouble and the world starts changing around you. And we got all that running. But it, as I say, it's an evolution upon the genre about a revolutionary experience. You know, so we're, we're doing evolutionary technology and, and the genre about revolution. Because really that's where this series is headed, right? Abe starts at the bottom in the worst place you'd ever want to be. And just through desperation of trying to stay alive and trying to help others that are in a similar circumstance winds up starting to affect economies, shut down factories, and eventually leads to uprisings that leads to movements that will lead to revolution that will eventually change the world. And so that's the theme of the story that we wanted to get back to, the slave that rises and changes the world after becoming public enemy number one just because he's trying to do the right thing. Right. You know? And uh, part of the, one, one of the many appeals of this game is the personality, the voices, the humor. What went into creating that for this game? Well, we're building off the legacy of it, right? And it's always supposed to be funny. I mean, like, we have some pretty heavy messaging in there, but it's all, like, dark side of globalization. Like, let's laugh at ourselves, and that's, that's kind of the best kind of black humor. Is let's, let's, just not, let's not take our problems too seriously, but let's not ignore them either. And so um, in that, we get... Uh, I'm losing track of that original question. Sorry, so go back to it. No worries, I'll ask it again. Uh, so part of the core appeal of Oddworld is its personality, especially like the voices and the humor that goes in. Uh, what went into creating that? So we're building on the legacy of that. You know, it was always important. The goal of us in establishing the sense of the, the emotional connectivity to our characters is that they emit something that makes us care about them a little bit. So that started with game speak and voices. And in that, then we wanted to expand on that vocabulary, expand on their sense of trauma. And so if someone feels like they're cooperating and I hear them saying cute, funny things and they're kind of slapstick, but then something really terrible and god awful happens to them, then I feel a little more engaged to try and protect the rest of them that are still yeah. uh, involved. So that adds up to lots of time in sound booths, you know, feeling out uh, different ways that it can happen because it's kind of happening constantly right like we have voices happening constantly it's not like you're in dialogues there are dialogue situations that happen but really it's reflective of the actions that you're doing people being grateful for it you know come with me we're all going to freedom and it's like yay he showed up finally let's go you know so it's like you get that sense of like the cheer is on and then like oh no they're all on fire you know yeah. put them out yeah. uh so that humor is always a critical part 
And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we, we, we're making, like, serious games that are seriously funny. Yeah. And it, because, it, first of all, it's got to be a great game, right? No matter what messaging you want to embed or subtext yeah. or this or that, it's got to be a great game because that's what people are putting their money and their value. And then hopefully it can be an inspiring game beyond just games, you know, an inspiring thing. of I've, We've got millions of stories that people have been giving us, maybe not millions, but thousands of stories of kind of the influence that Abe's had on their lives. Yeah. And one of the things we always do is, speaking of lives, is infinite lives. It's because we never want you to be a loser, yeah. right? And then there's nothing that makes me feel a loser, like a loser, like, you didn't do it right three times, now do it all over, damn it. And you're yeah. like, that sucked, yeah. you know? That was a quarter-driven mentality philosophy for making games. But for us, it's like, you fail, and then boop, you know, you're reborn pretty, pretty close by to your last fail position, and you can keep on going till you succeed. And that's where we had a high level of people actually completing our games, even though they've been historically kind of yeah, yeah. You know, brutally difficult. Yeah. Uh, this, this is, we have multiple sets of uh, play difficulty, so we have, you know, basically an easy, medium, and a hard, and in the game, you can actually succeed in this game by killing no one not even the bad guys that's the ultimate ending but that is really hard right yeah. and your karma of how you do things is reflected on the screen in real time and you see that hey, oh abe got some good karma points for that oh that was really some dark karma entering his heart it's like lightning is harder entering his heart and that goes to a second kind of economy that's going on in the world which is a spiritual economy that actually becomes one that you can spend if you've been earning it so through enough good karma achieving enough good chi you can convert that into what we call chi charms, which then opens up spiritual powers that you can purchase through, you know, your shamans and things that that, that you'll meet and, yeah. and greet in the game. So we try to add a lot more of these dynamic elements, but building on top of the classic Abe, all his basic moves are still there, and we've just done, expanded on them pretty pretty greatly, trying to keep intact what made him, you know, have that appeal in the beginning. Awesome. And just to remind us to find things off, when is the game coming out and on what platforms? Okay, so on platforms will be on uh, consoles and PC. I can't get into much more details than that right now. And for uh, timing, it's 2020 is our target. We can't say exactly when yet, but uh, you know, 2020. Cool. Like we need to bring it home. We've been in it three years. We've got another year to go, and we think we can do it. So we're on, we're on, the, we're on the treadmill to the whole way till victory. Cool. Thank you very much for your time. Hey, thank Cheers. you. Thanks for having us.